Hello everyone and welcome. Um, today we're looking at a webinar on understanding hazard vulnerability and capacity assessments in urban contexts, a five-step process. My name's Kate McFarlane and I'm a research advisor at the Asia Regional Office. And today I'm joined by Rania Sobia and Bruce Ravesleuth from Tango International who are the researchers that worked on this piece. Just before um, we sort of get into the process guide, I'll um, run through a little bit of context for you. This webinar is part of a webinar series on urban child-centred risk reduction and school safety. And this research is supported by CNA Foundation, CNA and Save the Children Switzerland. Just some housekeeping. There's an instant messaging box um, that you can use and feel free to put comments and questions throughout the presentation. We'll make sure those questions are answered at the end. The presentation will go for about 20 to 30 minutes and then we've got a lot of time at the end for questions. And I know Rania, um, has a lot of questions around the process and how we can test and, and refine this process guide. Um, just to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and we will be publishing uh, the webinar online. Also, just before we kick off, I can see we've got quite a few guests. So if you could write your name uh, the organisation you're with and where you're calling from today in the message box, that would be great. So for that context that I, I mentioned, this project is part of a larger research program. And in 2016, Save the Children conducted a scoping study looking at the gaps in child-centred risk reduction and school safety, evidence and guidance. And from that, we discovered three main themes where those gaps exist. So you can see those themes there on the left-hand side on the slide. And um, within that, there's 10 projects which fell within those three themes in the middle there and you can you can see the projects there and this uh, process guide falls within the theme of solutions for child-centred risk reduction and school safety. We also had two cross-cutting projects that, that looked across all the different themes. Um, and although we have identified the gaps um, and these projects have started to address those gaps, we continue to work with partners to um, continue to run research projects to fill those gaps. And the research findings from these projects are starting to emerge and they'll be ready at the end of May. And to disseminate those research findings, there are a number of guidance products and tools that we have developed. There's research reports, there's research report summaries and implementation tools and the HVCA process guide is one of those implementation tools. There's also research into practice briefs and these are really handy tools for practitioners. They're a concise literature review of research findings, best practice um, on discrete topic areas relevant to the program design and implementation. So it's topic areas such as emergency drills, uh, disaster risk reduction and inclusion and gender. We also have a shared bibliography online and that's all of the research reports that have went into the literature reviews are available online for anyone to use. And all of these um, guides and reports will be available on the GADRES website. They're not all up there at the moment, but they will be um, uploaded in the coming months. So you can see the address there on the screen. Before I hand over to Rania, I just wanted to give you some background to this topic. 
on understanding hazard vulnerability and capacity assessments in urban contexts. So what is a HVC, HVCA and why do we need a process guide? Well, just most of you on the call, I'm sure you've got a general understanding of a HVCA, so I'll just give a brief overview. It's a participatory process involving many stakeholders, particularly the community, and it's a process to collect and analyse information on local hazards and vulnerabilities and capacities. And there's many tools that you can use during this process, and some examples would be mappings and transect walks. And there's many toolkits available online, HVCA toolkits. And as part of this research program, the Overseas Development Institute undertook a scoping study and a needs assessment looking at what HVCA toolkits currently exist and what do they contain and also, also how do organisations decide how to best use their toolkits. And the findings from that scoping study went on to inform this process guide and I know Rania will cover that in her section on why the HVCA process guide. So at this stage, um, I'll hand over to Rania. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, can you see the slide? Um, yes, I, everyone can see it. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so um, I'll be making the presentation on the HVCA guide and then we'll have a brief discussion on the, uh, on the process on how we can further test this guide and refine it to make it more appropriate for users and then we'll take questions at the end. Um, so in terms of the objectives of this presentation, it's uh, mainly to introduce the HVCA guide to you. So I'll be going through the, the structure and the contents and also the background context to it. Um, and then we can have the discussion on the next steps. So um, in terms of why uh, we developed this process guide, um, I think um, the main reason um, was because of some of the limitations that were faced um, with existing um, HVCA tools that are out there um, in terms of how that can be applied in urban contexts. So I think that was the main starting point for us to think through um, how best we can um, develop a process to make use of you know, existing tools and to um, see how best we can fit existing guidance on HVCAs to urban contexts. So these are some of the gaps that we um, found. We reviewed about 22 HVCA tools from different organizations, um, both HVCA tools, the traditional kind of um, tools, as well as other you know, risk assessment uh, tools that are out there. Um, and we found that, uh, you know, there's limited focus on urban contexts, but also um, the, there was a heavy focus on natural hazards, but uh, limited emphasis on other types of shocks and stresses, uh, you know, related to climate change or other kind of economic shocks. Uh, and the broader kind of resilience element was missing in a lot of these tools. Um, there, there was also limited guidance on how to leverage technology. As you know, increasingly we're, we're relying on technology to uh, get uh, different types of disaster and climate risk data. Um, and of course, uh, early warning uh, mechanisms are also increasingly relying on technology. And there's lim limited mention of these options uh, in these existing uh, tools. Um, and in terms of the methods uh, or the, the approaches that have been prescribed in the HVCA tools, um, you'll find that it's very much rural oriented. Um, the, the different activities are very participatory, so that it's very time intensive. There's that implicit kind of assumption that 
you know, the target groups or the community um, is, you know, easily e easy to mobilize and uh, they're often defined by geographic boundaries in rural areas, but in urban contexts, it's harder to do uh, in terms of bringing communities or groups together. Um, also, the types of activities require less stakeholders. You know, there's the assumption that you can bring everyone together, but in urban contexts, you have, you know, more complex stakeholders. You need to engage them at different levels, and those things are not factored in these um, HVCA tools that we have. Um, also, in terms of the process, it's very linear, the types of steps that you have. There's little room for you to look at other tools or other guidance. Um, it doesn't really encourage a kind of flexible approach. So there are three things that we focused on. One is um, to add more guidance on the urban context. So we have given uh, you know, tips on urban contexts at every step. Um, but also we've um, we refer to different tools that are being developed for uh, particularly for urban areas. So hopefully that kind of captures the gaps um, on urban um, HVCAs. Um, and the second thing is we try to make the process a bit more analytical. So um, you know the typical kind of HVCAs focus very much on data collection, but not so much on um, data analysis um, or on, in terms of utilization, how you would use that data and information. So we, we've tried in the, the types of guidance we've provided uh, to emphasize more on the analysis. Um, and then thirdly, we also um, encourage the users to make use of the different tools that are out there. So for each step, we have given um, guidance on tools that we think are relevant. So for example, for a particular step on data collection, you want to uh, see any uh, focus on gender. We've given that guidance, you know, look up on this tool, page number this, um, and uh, you know, you can have a quick scan and basically um, decide whether you want to use it or not. So it encourages a very flexible approach in terms of using the different tools that are out there. Um, in terms of the target users, of course, you know, this process guide is designed for development for practitioners and uh, not necessarily, you know, for Save the Children stuff, but also other, um, we hope that other organizations will find this useful um, and we think it will be useful for, you know, senior management, um, project managers who are implementing urban programs, DRR programs, but also the field staff. Um, and in terms of when to use this guide, um, I think it's very important that we are very clear on um, the, the purpose. So typically the HVCA tools that we have are being implemented at very local level um, and they are usually done to feed into a DRR action plan. Um, basically you gather the data and then you, know, you prepare the DRR uh, plan based on that. And these are very localized activities, whereas this process guide looks at a more higher level kind of assessment. So um, it's really to, um, to support your programming, I would say. So if you want to, let's say, develop or design DRR or resilience um, strategies for your urban program, or if you want to integrate these strategies into an existing urban program or portfolio, at a more programmatic level, um, this process guide would be quite suitable. Um, also, if the if your organization or country office or program strategy, uh, if you're looking at you know um, adopting an urban focus or uh, urban resilience focus, this type of assessment would be very useful. Um, although we've you know given a lot of guidance on urban context. Um, we also think that even for other types of assessments which are not necessarily urban focused, um, this assessment would be, uh, process guide would be useful. Um, this is the structure of the process guide. So, um, you know, we have four sections, an introductory section, and then section two is the core of the guide, which really outlines, you know, five steps, very simple steps and uh, guidance on how to make decisions around the different steps. 
Um, we also have text boxes where we recommend the tools. So as I said, for each step, um, we have given a couple of tools and you know even page numbers to make it more efficient for you to kind of look up on the different guidance that is available in those tools and to see if it's you know appropriate and you can um, adopt it for that particular step. Um, and then in the appendix, we give more detail on those tools and the different, um, the specific guidance that we recommended in the text boxes. And then we have an appendix of the 22 tools that we used um, for this guide. So this is the five step process. As I mentioned, it's very simple. Um, the first step is really about um, scoping out the assessment and really making sure that, you know, from the outset, you understand the purpose um, of why you're doing the HVCA. Um, the second step is coming up with the um, assessment design um, and the kind of key questions that you want answered in your assessment. Um, step three is about doing the data collection. Step four, as I said, you know, there's emphasis on the data analysis, sense making, um, how you can use it. Um, and step five on the reporting and um, dissemination. So I'll just go through the five steps very quickly. Um, so um, step one, so for each step, we have about one or two you know, sub-steps or um, activities. So under step one, the first step is to um, basically understand the, uh, the purpose of why you are doing the HVCA. So as I mentioned, um, this process guide is more appropriate for programmatic um, kind of, uh, you know, um, work rather than the localized um, HVCA and DRL planning that you do. So uh, it's important that you make that distinction at the beginning. Um, also important to know who will use the results um, you know, will the urban, the, the local government use it, NGOs will use it, or is it only to save the children? Um, when would the results be used? Um, you know, is it the inception phase of a project or for the, uh, the country office as a whole? Um, for what purpose would the results be used? So it's important to really be clear at the outset um, why, um, <clears throat> why you're doing the HVCA. And then, um, uh, we also added some tips on the target groups, um, you know, uh, how to identify target groups in urban areas. As I mentioned, the typical HVCAs focus on the community, which are, you know, like the village or the these groups that are defined by geographic boundaries. But in urban areas, it's difficult for, for um, programmers to kind of focus on a ward or district Whereas you can gather um, target groups around, you know, common interests, common language. So we've given an additional guidance on that under this step. Um, at this step also, if, you know, you can already decide uh, based on your program um, whether you have a child focus um, kind of, you know, strategy that you want to see or, you know, if there's an education focus in this. Um, strategy, urban focus. So there are different dom domains that you can already look at or even a climate change focus. So in that case, in the text box, we've already given specific tools that address those domains. So if you have a, let's say a climate change focus, then you can quickly uh, you know, go to that uh, particular tool and have a quick scan of the guidance that's already available. Um, and once you're clear on the purpose, then, you know, it's important for you to um, um, know what type of resources that you have and what type of resources that you will need for this process. Um, <clears throat> so this is, uh, again, an important decision making point um, that, you know, we think is often missed in the process. So We've given some parameters, you know, that this is a type of team structure and skills that's required. Um, this is, you know, the budgeting, the different um, elements of the budget that you should consider. Um, we think, you know, this process would take about three to five months. So, you know, you should ask yourself whether the, the team has this amount of time, whether the project allows this amount of time for the assessment. Um, and also at, 
at the end of every step, we've given some quality assurance steps as well. Um, so for example, for this step, we've given a checklist just to make sure that you know you have everything that you need um, before you proceed to the next step. <clears throat> so step two is coming up with the uh, assessment design. Um, and the, basically what we mean by the assessment design or the assessment framework is the, the key topics that we want to focus on or the key questions that we want to have, you know, uh, to address in this assessment. Um, so uh, the first thing um, that we recommend is to do a secondary data review. So um, <clears throat> there's, again, a lot of um, guidance from existing tools in terms of doing secondary uh, literature review or data review. So we've highlighted those. Um, and also we have given key topics that maybe, you know, as a starting point, if you're not sure on the topics that um, you want to cover, this is a generic kind of, you know, outline that you can go for. So the, the, the context, basically in an urban area, looking at, you know, the governance system, the social economic system, um, the different types of risks, vulnerabilities, um, that are out there um, that are being, you know, that are facing uh, the community, the urban population, the different shocks and stresses, you know, um, and like I said, you know, we can not only focus on disasters or natural hazards, but also to look at broader shocks, including even economic shocks or price, you know, um, issues, um, climate change stresses, and then also to understand who are the vulnerable groups or disadvantaged groups in our, in our urban area. Um, also, we've, um, we've emphasized, you know, it's important to look at spatial analysis um, and really uh, to keep the, the, the secondary data review or the um, focus of the assessment at this stage as broad as possible. So even though you might, your program might, let's say, focus on, you know, slums or to work with um, children in slums, you might want to keep the um, secondary data review a bit broader around the whole urban area or the, to do a citywide kind of assessment. Um, because in a, uh, in a, you know, urban context, everything, you know, all the systems and kind of services are linked. So it's important for you to get that broader overview before you kind of uh, going to, you know, um, target or um, focus areas. Um, for these topics, we've also highlighted, you know, the types of data sources that you can look up. So that's basically, I mean, uh, how uh, the, the types of guidance we've given on doing the secondary data review. Um, and then as a second step, as I mentioned, you know, in an urban area, the um, stakeholders are quite complex. Um, and, you know, our consultations with different um, country officers and those who are implementing urban programs also mentioned that this is a, you know, challenging task just to get an understanding of the different stakeholders and also the influence and interest that they have. So it's very important that you do a more structured kind of stakeholder mapping um, to better understand how you can engage them in, you know, the process in terms of either getting data collection or identifying, you know, actions or strategies for those um, stakeholders. Um, and then uh, to wrap up step two, we have uh, recommended an inception workshop. So where you would present, you know, the findings from the, the secondary data review and also, um, also the um, stakeholder mapping to uh, basically answer the four questions that we have here. So I think at the inception stage, it's important that, you know, you have a basic understanding of the types of questions or what you want to understand from the assessment, who you want to engage, the stakeholder mapping, question two, um, and three, the tools and methods in term, particularly for data collection, and then a timeline or work plan, you know, which includes the data collection process, um, so these are the four things that needs to be kind of figured out. Um, we've given more 
guidance on the inception workshop, you know, uh, kind of a um, indicative agenda and also the people that you can invite. Um, and um, at the end of the inception workshop, you should have an assessment matrix, basically looking at the main questions and sub questions and where you will get the information from to answer those questions and who you would engage to um, address those questions. And then we've also, you know, as part of quality assurance, we've given like a checklist for the inception report. Um, <clears throat> so we'll move on to step three. Um, step three is about data collection. So um, here again, uh, the first step, the sub step is to um, train the team on data collection. So um, from the inception um, workshop and the assessment framework, you would already know whether you need to do a quantitative survey or whether you would only do qualitative data collection. So um, it's important that you identify your team and also to make sure that they have the right, right skills to facilitate um, the, the different data collection. Um, we've also looked at different technological um, options for data collection, including use of mobile phones and tablets, in which case, um, you know, uh, the training session should include um, how to use those tools. We've given some um, available guidance on, on those as well. Um, um, so, yeah, um, and the second sub-step is the real-time data collection, which is, you know, facilitated by these uh, tools like tablets and uh, mobile phones um, with GIS um, functionality. So there's, you know, information around those. And then um, as a quality assurance kind of uh, step or um, quality assurance method, um, we've given several options, you know, how you can improve the data collection um, process and to make sure that, you know, uh, there's quality data being um, collected. <clears throat> step four, um, step four focuses on the data analysis and sense making. This is an important step. Um, and the first kind of sub step is to organize the data or the information that you collect. Again, you know, depending on the scope of your assessment or the focus of your assessment, um, you know, you, you might have a different um, kind of structure, but um, we've given based on, you know, uh, the different uh, urban assessments that we've seen, we've given topics around which you can uh, organize your information. And then um, once you organize the information, you can an, uh, analyze the data within those topics, then you can see how best you can, you know, compile it into a report. But as a first step in terms of organizing the data, we think these are some of the topics, you know, the, the city-wide risks, the different challenges, you know, um, or constraints that an urban system faces including the governance challenges, you know, uh, infrastructure challenges, um, and then the vulnerability of different stakeholders and even capacity analysis of different stakeholders and systems. So these are some of the um, areas um, that you can organize the data around. And then, um, you know, if there's interest to look at resilience, um, we've also highlighted how to organize the information around the three capacities um, which usually form the resilience assessment, which is the absorptive capacity, um, adaptive capacity, and transformative capacity. Um, and then uh, under step four, once you organize the information, we feel that it would, it would be good if you can organize uh, uh, the third workshop in the, that has been recommended in this process guide, which is a sense-making workshop. Um, where you can, you know, uh, basically present the, pre the preliminary analysis and findings um, from, you know, how you've organized and analyzed the data. Uh, you can also, um, if you want to focus on resilience, uh, you know, you can um, prepare a matrix. Um, we have more information on that in the guide. Um, 
and then also identify a very a very importantly um, identify the strategic entry points you know what are the opportunities for you to um, address those gaps or the, the gaps in capacities um, in through your program or through the, the different um, services or um, mandates of the different stakeholders, including the local government or the NGOs and other actors that you, in, you know, who are involved in this process. Um, and then uh, we suggested maybe based on the challenges that you identified in the previous step, you can also put together a, a draft problem tree. So as preparation for the workshop, these are some of the information that you need to kind of put together. And then you can, we, we suggest that you have a two-day workshop where, you know, you can um, basically validate the findings and also um, develop a, maybe a theory of change type um, framework or, um, you know, solution tree uh, to the different problems and then find, uh, you know, the different strategies or activities that, or interventions that you want to integrate into your portfolio or program or country strategy. Um, again, for the audience of the sense making workshop, we feel that, you know, the program staff, um, any and other kind of um, experts from different areas, for example, if it's a child focused area, maybe people from child protection unit um, and any other external stakeholders, any strategic stakeholders, you know, that you can bring on board externally <coughs> um, for this workshop. Step five is on reporting and dissemination. Um, here again, we have two um, sub steps. So uh, the first sub step is about drafting the report. Again, you know, um, we've given some guidance on um, how to kind of compile the um, findings and uh, to make the report as you know clear and analytical as possible. Um, and then. <clears throat> Uh, as a second sub-step, um, we've uh, also outlined for you, you know, possible options for packaging and dissemination. Again, this will depend on you, the, the, you know, the purpose of your assessment and why you're doing it. So, um, you know, depending on that, you can basically select um, options for disseminating the information. Um, as quality assurance, we've given a checklist for the report, um, you know, the main kind of uh, sections that you should have. Um, so that's, those are the five main steps. Um, as I mentioned, these are simple steps um, with, you know, additional guidance on um, the urban context, how you can apply these steps in urban context. and in an urban context and also with additional guidance on how you can effectively use other tools that are out there for uh, making your process more, you know, um, more analytical and um, more complete. So um, in terms of the next steps, um, you know, we have the uh, process guide, um, which has been reviewed internally um, uh, by Save the Children, um, uh, different um, staff, I think, um, and we've done several iterations. Um, I think at this stage, we would really like to hear from you in terms of how best we can um, pilot the process guide or apply it um, and see how we can further refine the steps to make it more useful um, for, for staff. So the objectives of, uh, yeah, um, basically refining the process guide is to test whether the guidance we provide is appropriate and also whether the steps and process we have, uh, whether it's relevant to the type of programming that you do. Um, and opportunities to field test the process guide. We think, you know, you can do it prior to a project or program design. Um, if you are going to um, basically have a urban program, maybe you can um, pilot the assessment and then 
see how you can use the findings to design your program um, or even as part of a baseline. If you plan for a baseline to study, you can integrate DHVC assessment um, guide or elements of it into that baseline. Um, if you plan to have a country-based strategy or more of an organizational strategy, if you plan to do a country program uh, level, you know, um, activity, maybe there's room for you to pilot the assessment. Um, or as I mentioned, you know, um, if you are in an inception phase of an urban project or program, maybe you will have some room to do this process, uh, to do this assessment. Um, we think the, the piloting could take about four to six months, but again, it will depend on the type of uh, topics and the scope of assessment that you want to do. Um, so these are some of the, the questions that I have, um, but we can have a broader discussion and feedback around uh, these uh, questions. So, you know, if you were to um, pilot the process guide, um, what type of orientation would you need? What type of material would help you to familiarize with the guide? What type of technical assistance would you need? Uh, at what level? At you know, from the, the technical advisors or country level, country office level? Um, how can we document the findings and how we can aggregate the findings from the different country officers? So there are some suggestions here. Maybe we can form a working group and have regular updates, online sessions to exchange the feedback. Um, and then, you know, we can, we, we can use the information to validate the steps and further refine and improve the process guide. That's it. Um, thank you very much. Thanks. Rania for that. Um, just to let everyone know, the, the process guide is just in the final stages of sign off within Save the Children and will be available in a number of weeks. And it really is going to be an iterative guide which through um, using it and, and refining it, we, we build on it um, as well. So Rania, perhaps if we take the slides back to those questions which might spark some responses from people. But to kick off, I know Marla, you had a comment there. Did you want to jump on? Sure. Um, you know, trying to understand the genesis of HVCA, you know, is really in um, rural um, appraisal and what you know HVCA is designed as a participatory tool in that is used to engage communities in understanding their own context and then you know to be used for planning um, locally so this seems to be um, a different enterprise entirely so I'm not sure either um, what it's for and who it's by and for Okay, hi everyone. This is uh, Bruce speaking. I'm, I'm uh, one of the partners of Tango International and I've worked with uh, Rani on this. Thanks for that question, Marla. Um, Rani just pinged me in and asked me to take this because it is very much around the rationale of, of doing this guide. <laughs> so it's, um, in terms of who it's for, uh, it, it is, it is an, a, an assessment process um, for you know, more tailored to an urban setting and looking at larger scale assessment. It retains a lot of the principles of HPCA, those that can actually be carried over into urban assessments. And that includes some of the participatory tools, the engagement with stakeholders, uh, with community members, with your program participants, your expected program participants. So a lot of that is retained from what we know as, as, as traditional rural assessment, rural appraisal, if you will. Uh, what, this, what this does is it recognizes where we are right now in urban programming, which is for many of the organizations, including SAVE, it's at a starting point. We, uh, we've done urban work uh, probably uh, for some time now, mainly focusing on slum areas, but we really haven't worked very much on urban systems. And I obviously can't speak for SAVE as a whole, um, but from our experience with SAVE, we know a lot of programming is still rural. We had extensive interviews with your peer organizations, Mercy Corps, uh, CARE, CRS, 
and a number of others to understand where they are in their urban programming and, and, and what would be most useful for them in terms of assessments to inform those types of programs. Um, what we found, confirmed with ODI said, is that a lot of the current tools that are out there um, are not very user friendly uh, for the reasons already mentioned by, um, by Rania. They're not tailored to urban systems, urban context, urban governance. So a lot of the prompts, if you will, that lead you through those toolkits just aren't very effective in an urban setting. Um, at the same time, because urban systems are more complex, um, there was a um, kind of a tendency amongst your peer organizations as well as your country offices to, to demand a, a more of a research process, a structured research process. It's not so much about the tools. We, I mean, we know the various exercises that can work in a focus group setting, and we know that hazard maps are useful, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it really is how do we take what is usually a very complex and layered piece of assessment and come up with a process guide, step one through five in our case, that actually leads the user um, uh, through that process without getting lost and going down rabbit holes in terms of which specific toolkit to use and not to use. So Marla, just in, to, to wrap that up and, 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 and to your general question, it's an iteration of HVCA. It's applicable at more of a landscape level, level and it takes the, uh, the urban complexity into a more specific account. And we do two things. We use existing guidance that is sprinkled throughout the tools that exist already around urban context. So that's brought into this guide. We also bring in some of our own experience in terms of how we do urban assessment. Um, and all of that is hinged around what we would call a quality assured research process, simply good research. Um, that hopefully, if we stick to these steps, the rest of the things click into place. Um, I'll start there. Rania, did you want to add anything to that reply? Over to you. No, I think you covered that. Um, yeah, as, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program as well, um, the assessment or the guide uh, is more appropriate, you know, for programming um, rather than to do the more localized kind of HVCAs that uh, split small groups. I can see that um, Kirsty, our colleague from Fiji, has um, a good point. A lot of our countries are doing their child rights situation analysis at the moment, um, and it might be a great idea to share this through our online um, Facebook at work um, to potentially inspire some country officers as they go through that process. Um, I can also see there's a question from Marit, um, and Marit says, in the beginning you talked about nonlinear processes, but I cannot really see how this is reflected in the steps presented. I can, a concern I often have with the HVCAs is that we, uh, HVCAs we do in rural, rural schools is that I don't always see that we have good tools for updating them, validating them. Uh, uh, let Marit know if anyone has any good tools for that. Um, and then what you were saying about nonlinear seems interesting in this sense. Could your tool analysis, etc., be updated continuously uh, with GIS maps, etc.? Uh, report form might not be the best output then. And she's just asking for any reflections, but I was wondering if um, Rania or Bruce had any comments on that. Yeah, in terms of the nonlinear process, um, you know, uh, in the presentation, I, I basically um, kept it very brief, the, the broad steps. But if you look at the actual guidance, you know, we don't uh, prescribe a particular kind of activity or this is how you should do this particular step. Um, instead, we have given different options and we have given um, kind of, uh, you know, points for decision making that would help uh, or allow the user to actually kind of uh, contextualize the guidance and to apply it uh, to their context. And in the same way, um, that was the purpose of having the, the different the two guidance as well. So for each step, and even in some cases, you know, sub steps, we've given the, the different uh, you know a, a list of tools and the different guidance that's already there. We've done the background research and 
you know, the user can basically uh, <clears throat> go through them and decide which ones to use um, for the assessment. So that that was the intention, uh, you know, in terms of making the, the process non-linear and make it more flexible. So at each step, we've, we've given tips, we've given, you know, different questions, but we're not describing, uh, you know, this particular kind of guidance. Um, it's up to the user to, to make those decisions. Bruce, did you want to add to that? Uh, I think maybe the latter point, you already covered the first point. So the, the um, can the tool analysis be updated continuously, Marit? I'm just going back to another question. Uh, something around concern how with HCCAs we do in rural schools that we don't always have, uh, see that we have good tools for updating, validating them. So I think your question here, Marit, is very much around kind of an ongoing um, uh, information collection and information use. Uh, I think that's what you're getting at here, at least. That's my interpretation. So, the assessment. This is a this is a broad assessment, right? I mean, you cast a net wide around your you know specific questions that have purpose um, in your particular domain, which would in this case be child-centric urban programming by safety children, for example, and that can take many shapes or forms. So, as you work through the first couple of steps, you 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 establish focus and you you establish clarity around which questions are really the most important ones to ask while keeping the research manageable. Um, and not getting lost in, in too much information, right? Information has a shelf life, we have too much of it, we don't use it, we can chuck it in six months and we have to start again. The flip side of that is that these types of assessments um, uh, in themselves only have a shelf life of a year or so. You, you do need to continuously update your understanding, both in terms of your situational assessment, your, your capacity assessment of your, of your stakeholders, your participants, etc. So these, I want to call the kind of landscape assessments, are a first step in um, more strategic um, and, and focused use of information throughout a program cycle or throughout a country strategic program. So um, yes, this assessment should be updated on a regular basis and that can be through project monitoring surveys that are conducted on an annual basis, that could be through country office learning agendas, um, which perhaps the this assessment uh, could give some ideas about interesting questions that we should be tracking as a country office around assumptions that we have around what's relevant, what's not relevant, what works, what doesn't. Um, so th th these assessments really are a first step and provide direction to larger scale uh, fit for purpose information use throughout the, throughout the program. Um, so yes to updates, um, how you do that, as Rania said, that depends on your resources and the guide itself gives a more or less a decision tree to help the users make those decisions. How you then you know, fill in the assessment type or what, what information data collection activity you do, that's that's left to the user itself. I'll stop there. Thanks, Bruce. And I, I can see a comment from Deborah Dricha who works on our urban DRR program in India um, and can can see a use for this tool as they start planning for phase two. Um, does anyone else have any questions or comments? Uh, please feel free to use your microphone. I can see that Kersey is typing something. Okay, while they're typing, I'll just jump in. It's Nick Ireland here from Save Based in Melbourne. Um, to Murat's point on validating these things, updating is notoriously difficult, but one of the things that we found that is often very helpful in terms of validation is looking at where the money is going to come from to be able to support the activities that are being identified through the process. Sometimes that may be through project funding of um, the organization, but other times, ultimately, for sustainability, you want to find a source of funding that in an urban context is going to be the city officials or some sort of a um, government body. So the validation we've always found very useful to involve those bodies in the process of 
first at the very beginning in designing in terms of what you're doing, going through the process of hazard um, vulnerability capacity assessment, and then with the action planning, getting them very much involved in the validation with the hope that if a project can seed fund some things at the beginning, you can demonstrate impact, then hopefully at a later date they will um, believe in the process and uptake it and roll it out into other areas or fund other needs as they occur, as risks or vulnerabilities may change in the area. I don't think I've ever seen any specific tool for that per se, but I think there's quite a few um, good examples, including the Lao program of where they really heavily involved government authorities in that process of validation. Um, to then include the plans into, I think the, the local governments had development funding, so to try to include them into the development funding planning process. Can I add to that a bit, uh, Nick? Um, the process that is used for validation is, is basically research triangulation, and what we're what we're doing is we're as we set up this the, this type of assessment, um, we kind of approached it. The Tango is a consulting firm, and we approached it and we checked with our peer organizations as well, um, as as we would a, an assessment consultancy. So, if um, say the children would uh, outsource this, and in many cases for your larger programs, um, they are outsourced. Um, we would make sure that that uh, that we have a you know triangulation worked into the the the, the assessment matrix. Um, so every question um, uh, needs to, the, you know, the responses need to be validated by additional research with other stakeholders. Stakeholder mapping is a, is a key part of this, and we really emphasize this in the guide as well, making sure you're asking the, the right people the right questions and that you engage them throughout the research process. So we're trying to really emphasize that point around the validation on the front end by making sure that you've got a very well-layered um, uh, assessment matrix. Where, there, where there's not one source, and uh, we also have an assessment about the quality of the information you get from that source, um, so that you're not relying on one response and, 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 and the, the inputs are validated um, throughout. Over to you. Thanks, Bruce and Nick. Uh, we've got a, another question from Kirsty. Uh, you said limited emphasis on resilience, but isn't capacity and resources a lot about resilience? Yes, it is. Um, I hope I hope I didn't say limited emphasis on resilience. <laughs> and if we did say it in the in the presentation, um, then perhaps a better way to state it is that we're um, kind of using a resilience wrapper. For this, for this whole assessment process, um, we're not being specific about the, uh, although we're including it, about you know the the resilience language that has been emerging over the last couple of years. We do talk about the capacities, and and we would personally, if you'd ask Tango straight up, we would use the resilience framework, the current three capacity resilience framework, as our analytical framework uh, to actually do these types of assessments. I recall when we tested this approach with your colleagues in the Philippines, um, because as part of this this whole process. We also had workshops in two safety children consular offices. It only really started making sense to them when we brought in that, that resilience framework um, as a way to look at whether you're collecting the right information. Right? The resilience framework and the understanding we have around absorptive, adaptive, transformative capacities, how that links to systems, etc. That really helped prompt um, uh, the team to understand, oh, we actually need to figure more we need to know more about these sets of capacities. We need to know more about these sets of systems. So that really gave some useful input into defining the, the questions, making sure they're relevant to our context. The resilience obviously also allows a much broader uh, view on hazards um, than, than, than many of the natural disasters that um, um, uh, that are currently the focus of ACC is still. Uh, Kirsty, to your, your, your question, which framework are you talking about? So the Food Security Information Network um, it has adopted, um, it's called the Resilience Framework, so it, it refers to three capacities, absorptive, adaptive, and transformative. They're currently being picked up by, um, by DFID as well. USAID adopted it as its Resilience Framework um, for its uh, food security programming. Um, and we're, there's different iterations out there currently also being involved for the education sector as well. It doesn't really, it's not really anything new, uh, See, it just, it, it frames, um, it, it establishes some consistency in language. Uh, the transformative capacity really helps establish a strong focus on systems, etc. Um, 
within Save the Children, you also, as an organization, have bought into the three capacity framework. We've developed several briefs for you guys and have done some training programs for SAVE as well. So you're very much on board on this as well. Um, it hasn't quite trickled down to your country offices. I did a regional training here in Bangkok about two years ago, and I think it was the first time that many many of your colleagues actually um, heard about this framework. But it's it's out there, and we're happy to circulate more information. So from our point of view, you know, resilience is the wrapper. We think it's, it's a great starting point in terms of understanding which questions you should be answering, asking. Over to you. Thanks, Bruce. And I can see um, there's a question from Naomi just saying that Save the Children Indonesia is planning to do a HVCA in roadside safety program at schools in Jakarta this year. Uh, what support can we receive or what contribution can we make? And this is a Save the Children Japan funded uh, project. Um, I understand that to mean in terms of um, testing and refining the HVCA process tool, Naomi. And we, we can um, certainly talk um, after the webinar about perhaps how, how we can go through that process. Um, and it would be great to have Indonesia and Save the Children Japan on board with that. Uh, we've got about four minutes left. Does anyone else have any last burning questions? I can see a, a couple of people are typing, so we, we might just see if anything else pops up. While, uh, while we're waiting, can I just pop in with a couple of comments? Um, the first thing is just around the, the process itself, and I, I shared this with, with Kate um, a couple of weeks ago. So for those of you who are familiar with Mercy Corps, they've got something called the Stress Strategic Resilience Assessment Tool. And it's um, actually it's very similar to what we're doing here. Um, we Tango was at the, you know, at the beginning of the stress process. We were involved with them. We did a, an urban resilience assessment for them in China at one point in the very early days when the thing was still being evolved. But what's interesting really is the similarities with what, what, we, what we're doing here and what Mercy Corps is, is rolling out uh, throughout its organizations as well. And it is, uh, to summarize it, and I said it before, but I will summarize it again because the emphasis needs to be made. It's moving away from prescribed toolkits um, that say, you know, these are the the uh, the types of uh, PRA exercises you need to do, and then there's 12 in an annex, and it tells you how long you you know what you need, and you need flip charts, etc., etc. We're moving away from that, um, and we're really looking at at robust assessment um, within you know within the resources that we have. So I think we've got a five-step process. They actually came up with a three or four-step process. I don't quite recall. But it really comes down to the same thing, asking the right, getting your, your questions really sorted out properly, being very strategic, purposeful about what, you know, where you invest your, the resources you do have for primary data collection, assuring quality throughout and having this, this iteration with your stakeholders on an ongoing basis and your participants um, around this triangulation, validation, sense making piece. Um, the principles are actually very common. Um, across uh, across these two processes, again we also validated with CRS and CARE um, that they're irrespective of the toolkits they have available. These are essentially the steps that they follow and that they would describe when they talk about good assessment process and assessments that have worked out really well for them. Just in terms of the um, the you know, going forward um, and and the field testing, I mean the tool the process itself. Um, obviously can be tweaked and tinkered with. But I, what I think would be really useful is to build a, almost a catalog, a log, as Rania called it, all the examples um, uh, of how you know, assessment designs, how various country offices have, have, have taken this tool and uh, this process guide and actually used it and uh, what did the assessments look like, what didn't, what didn't work, what, what worked well, and having kind of you know, short process documentation briefs that can be a resource for petitioners to understand the pitfalls of doing these assessments. And we, we we, we often we often get, you know get into problems, particularly around the analysis phase. So I think that type of uh, building that type of knowledge within the organization, real practitioner oriented do's and don'ts from, from particular examples, um, I think that would be helpful. The last question, you know, although Tango's contract is ending on this, we are a long-term partner to save, and we'd be more than happy 
to to be uh, available throughout these types of uh, uh, exercises as you as you start using it, uh, and obviously on a no cost basis, just to hear how things are going, give advice here or there if necessary, possibly even get involved in certain assessments. So feel free to reach out. Over to you. Thanks, Bruce, and, and some great tips there. I think I've shared the um, Mercy Corps um, stresses assessment there, and they just scraped in with four steps, so <laughs> just under five. Um, so this brings us to time. I just want to thank Rania and Bruce um, for all your hard work on on this presentation, but also on the, the wider process tool development. It's been a long journey um, and it'll be great to have you um, in partnership as we, as we roll this out and learn from it being used further. So thank you very much. And also a big thank you to everyone for joining. This uh, webinar recording will go up on Workplace as well as um, the, there's a Asia Learning from Research playlist on our YouTube channel where it will sit and I can share all of those links um, in the coming days. So feel free to reach out and email me if you have any questions. I've got a couple of people I'll be following up with. Um, thank you, everyone.